Uh, it's May 6, 1992. This is my birthday, folks, and I'm going to do a show tonight that I don't want to do, but it's got to be done by somebody, and I'm the one that's going to do it. We've all been watching our television for the last week and a half, listening to the radio, watching fires burn, watching stores, businesses looted, watching a poor truck driver yanked out of his truck and beat senseless on the ground. When he got up and tried to get away, got into his truck, he couldn't see. A woman came up and asked him, can you see? He said, no. She said, I'll be your eyes. And such was the scenes that we watched. And we were torn, torn between understanding and loathing and hatred and love and shame. And what for? And that's the subject of tonight's The Hour of the Time. What it's like to be a black person in America? It's like being in hell, if you can visualize that. It's like being in a living hell. Your life is not worth anything. And that's a sad commentary. Black in America, even in 19... 92 hasn't changed much. We have no right that the white man respect. Four police officers stood trial in Simi Valley, California for the beating of a man named Rodney King, a black man. The jury came across with its final verdict on a day that will live in infamy and for some people, today will be famous, for they loved the verdict. Those people are racist. They're people with no heart. The verdict was, for three of the defendants, not guilty on all counts, complete acquittal. For the last defendant, Officer Powell, was not guilty on all counts but one, and the last count that he used excessive force was a hung jury. An incredible verdict in light of the fact that the entire nation and the world had been viewing an amateur videotape that had been taken on the scene which showed over 50 blows, I believe the correct number was 56 blows in 80 seconds to a man who was lying on the ground who had no weapon, who posed no threat who did not attack anyone during this time. But nevertheless, 56 blows from clubs, what the officers called batons, that's a polite name for a club, a stick. And I believe no one believed that those officers would be found innocent. Hardly anyone, anyway. I'm sure that there were some people who felt that the officers were justified. There always is. I'm sure that most police officers sided with their peers. I'm sure that they felt the officers should be excused, overlooked, that they should be forgiven because of the dangers of the job, because that they go out in the street every day and they could be killed at any given moment so that makes them do things that sometimes people should not do. Is that justified? Should people think that way? Well, that's been the debate all over the nation and all around the world. And in the main, I have to say, that argument has lost. Most people were shocked. Shocked to the very core of their being over that verdict. And not just blacks. Whites were shocked. Hispanics were shocked. Puerto Ricans were shocked. Chinese people were shocked. Japanese people were shocked. And of course the black community was outraged. In a country with a history of prejudice, oppression, in a country 
where to be a black person is a struggle from the moment of birth until the moment of death. This was an outrage. It was as if they had already been thrown into the cesspool of life and somebody had come along and dumped another cesspool right on top of them. It took all the hope away from these people. At least that's what they tell me. And I have to tell you, it took some hope away from me because I've been predicting this for a long, long time. In fact, I'm going to give you now a speech that I delivered in New York City on April the 26th, 1992, just a few days before this incident took place. The incident that resulted in hundreds of buildings burned to the ground. I believe the last count that I heard 1,700 buildings burned to the ground in Los Angeles. Over 40 people dead, more than in the Watts riots. Hundreds of people wounded. Over 700 people arrested. Many businessmen out of business forever. An entire economic community destroyed. I have to tell you folks, no business, no businessman in his right mind will ever go back into South Central Los Angeles and open a grocery store, supermarket, a discount store, an electronics store, a stereo store, any kind of store. It's not going to happen. It is not going to happen. If those people thought that they were bad off before, they are now destitute. In New York City on April the 26th, this is what I told my audience of approximately 600 people. I asked them to close their eyes. And on their eyelids, to draw a map of the United States and all of its possessions. And on that map, place a dot for every city and town in this great nation of ours. Every city and town. Put a dot there. Now, if you're like I am, you've got so many dots there, you probably couldn't count them in a week. Because that's how big this country is. I want you all to understand that at any given moment, of any given hour, of any given day, of any given week, of any given month, of any given year, if you've got enough money, in every single one of those towns or cities, you can buy as much of any type of drug that you can imagine or that you could possibly want if you have the money to pay for it on some street corner and in some cities and towns on many street corners now I want you to take yourself and your imagination to that street corner in whatever town that you pick and I want you to understand that whatever amount of money you have in your hand will buy whatever amount of drugs of any kind of drug that you want any kind at any time. And there will never be a shortage. The drugs will always be there as long as you have the money in your hand. Now just imagine what kind of a supply system does that require? Do you understand how much cargo of drugs has to be coming into this country continually all the time? to make sure that each drug in its exact quantity that's needed in each city and each town of this country is delivered to that city 
in that state or in that town, in that state, on time, so that there's never a shortage? Do you realize that in Silmar, California, which is in the San Fernando Valley, near Los Angeles, in a warehouse with a cheap padlock on the door and no guard anywhere, law enforcement officials found 22 tons of pure cocaine. 22 tons of pure cocaine. They confiscated it, took it away. Now that has a street value of 22 billion dollars, not million, billion, spelled with a B. When I read that in the Los Angeles Times and saw it on television, I began to try to track that cocaine. I was told that it was placed in the property unit of the Los Angeles Police Department. When I attempted to verify that it was there, I was told that it was not. When I tried to trace it from the property department of the Los Angeles Police Department, according to proper procedures, it should have been burned, destroyed. However, there was no record of its destruction. There was no record of its ever having left the property department. There was no record of any trace of that 22 tons of pure cocaine. $22 billion street value. Now, I hope you understand that that's just one city, one little small town. In fact, Silmar is not very big. It is not Los Angeles. One little small town in this whole nation. Now, in just in the last few days, I believe they found six tons of cocaine in a warehouse somewhere and, and uh, a whole bunch of tons of cocaine in another warehouse somewhere. But you see, I don't even pay any attention to it anymore because I know that if you try to trace those those bags of cocaine, you won't find them. They go right back out onto the street, right through the police department as if it's got holes in it. It's incredible. You see, because money talks. The old saying is, BS walks. You all know what that means. Money talks. Pretty hard for somebody to burn 22 tons of cocaine, but that's not the reason why it wasn't burned. So you have to understand, to get that much drugs into this country, so that every little city and town in this entire country is supplied with drugs, takes much more, much, much more. So much more that it's almost impossible to imagine much more than any Colombian drug lord could ever handle. And there's no Colombian drug lord that has anywhere near the amount of money that would be required to perform a logistics operation of that magnitude. When I was with the Office of Naval Intelligence, my friends, I can tell you that I discovered that the drugs are being brought into this country by the military and the intelligence community. And the way they get through customs officials and by law enforcement officers is that they are classified cargoes, secret cargoes, top secret cargoes. No one could look at them unless they have the clearance and the need to know and the cargo is addressed to them. Much of the drugs are flown in to places like Edwards Air Force Base, California. There's a place in uh, Arizona, which is a CIA proprietary airfield. There's a place in Florida, Homestead Air Force Base, and many, many others. There are tunnels going underneath the Mexican border. The Mexicans didn't dig those tunnels. No, these are smooth operations. No one ever gets caught in the drug war, except users. Have you ever noticed that? 
are small time operators with real small cargoes. And anytime a huge tremendous